We are in Paris at the home of Ivan Vishnegradsky, who in the 1920s was the inventor of the quarter-tone piano. And that is the instrument you just heard. Uh, it's an instrument built by the August Furster Company. And uh, Mr. Vishnegradsky, who for many, many years has been a pioneer in microtonal music, uh, is living in Paris at uh, his new home now. He was at another home on the Rue Mademoiselle for, uh, since 1925, and just recently has moved to a new home uh, where we are in the 15th arrondissement in Paris. I think uh, it would be very interesting, uh, Yvonne, if we could say a few things about what your current activities are now, what it is you're working on at the moment uh, in 1976. Um, actually, uh, I must say I don't uh, compose new uh, works. I, I have a, I'm in a period where I think uh, about my old works and uh, have desire to bring some uh, order in it because I must confess. Uh, all those old papers are in a great disorder. Most of my works are not uh, edited. And fortunately, because I find uh, many of them, uh, maybe half of them, need uh, a little uh, improvements, uh, some very serious, and some little bit. Anyhow, they need it. And uh, I profit uh, now. Uh, all my free time uh, to devote to this. I say free time because now I'm engaged in a uh, in a work, very substantial work. So it's very important for, for me, namely, uh, I, I don't know um, if, uh, of course, uh, uh, you, I must tell you a little bit of my not biography, but uh, I have a wor work um, uh, which I consider as the most important of my works. It's an old work, really. It is a work of my youth, and uh, at the same time, is my last half tone work, uh, like uh, la last work which I wrote in the traditional uh, medium of half tones. And uh, I could say that even it's the, uh, the first microtone work because it contains as a possibility, especially in the last part of this work, of microtonal harmonies, microtonal uh, melodies. And I think even that uh, maybe uh, some days I will write a v version of the whole conclusive part in microtonal, in microtones, in quarter tone and sixth tone. What is the name of this piece? Uh, the uh, name of this piece is The Day of Existence. Uh, the first name of it was The Day of Brahma. It was conceived after um, my, I made acquaintance um, with the Hindu philosophy of uh, the, the religious philosophy, theology of their theology, uh, of the days of and nights of Brahma. The world is con uh, uh, conceived, by this philosophy, as the succession of uh, days, um, days of the, they called Manvantara and nights, they call it Pralaya, of Brahma. Uh, when the Brahma is awakened, it means that the world is existing. And then will come a moment that the, the Brahma will fall asleep, it will, the world will disappear. In a sense, uh, the world is the dream of drama, uh, Brahma. And uh, then after uh, the pralaya is finished, it begins the awakening of Brahma at the same time at the beginning of the world. Uh, that inspired me to conceive a um, uh, sim big symphonic piece um, uh, called The Day of Brahma. Uh, but uh, later, uh, this uh, idea evolved it. First of all, I found necessary to uh, uh, join a text, a spoken text, not sang, but spoken, because it was very necessary for me that this text is understood. Whereas when this text is uh, sung, usually 
the world, uh, the words, uh, they are uh, deluded in the element of music, of melody, and there is no real synthesis of two opposite sides uh, uh, of equal importance. Uh, it means the two sides are the music, it's the emotion, and the words is the comprehension. Uh, well, and uh, then um, after that, I, uh, late, later, I changed the work, uh, the name of a day of Brahma to the of day of existence. And, uh, Could you say when it was you composed these pieces? Uh, the, the oh makeup yes, there? yes. The first, um, uh, the first, the first, the first, the first uh, score was written very long ago. Uh, in uh, I began to write it in November 1916, and wrote the whole year of 17. It means during the revolution in Russia during the both revolutions in Russia, and I finished by the, by the 1st January um, 1918. Uh, in Paris? No, no, I was still in Russia. At the moment, I was still in Russia. Uh, I, was, I mean, much later, um, in uh, France, namely in 1920, because after um, I have written this work, I must say also that uh, why I consider this work as being the most important? Because it contains in its uh, potentiality of all what I did after that. Um, it is, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, a source of my other uh, activities uh, as a composer. And uh, in particular, the micro microtono I don't like it with the word microtone. Let's say ultrachromatic, um, ultrachromatic uh, activity. Is, uh, it means writing uh, works in ultrachromatic scales. And that is just the uh, great difference between me and some other composers who write with microtones. They don't conceive it like a scale. For me, it is. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't be. It is not interesting to use microtone as simple effects at simple accidental intervals. But what is important is to have at a basis before even the work is began, before it is conceived, the scale of the twenty-four uh, quarter tones in an octave or the 36 six tone in an octave. Uh, another uh, composer, the only one who was, uh, who thought like me, and who was in, in a sense my alter ego, it was Alois Haber, who is uh, known in Germany and probably is known over the world as a, also a pioneer of, uh, my, of uh, ultrachromati ultrachromaticism. And uh, with him, I had uh, we, we met each other, and we we worked even each other for elaborating the uh, the keyboard for the new quarter tone piano. It was very important. It was the the year the twenties, uh, all the twenties, uh, yes, that uh, I was uh, busy with with this. It's a long story, it's uh, not interesting. But finally, it was so that uh, we co uh, our collaboration uh, took an end. We were together during nine months only. I was in Germany at the time, but I had to leave Germany because uh, my visa wasn't pro not uh, prolonged. prolonged. And, um, and then Haba alone, he built this piano, uh, uh, piano. My friend Amir Kanyan was so nice uh, to me to tell me that I am the inventor of the. It's true, I am the inventor, particularly the inventor of the keyboard. Uh, uh, my keyboard was um, the idea of my keyboard was 
to superpose the two monuments, but not enough, not two months, to add a third one uh, who would reproduce the first. It was very important to make uh, um, it uh, easier to play for the pianistic uh, reasons. Uh, otherwise, uh, the invention of it was really the work of specialists of firma, firma Förster, um, and uh, Haber role also. One can say it was invented by Haber, me, and the firma, uh, the firma Förster. That's what. That is really. Uh, cool. um, could you, could you talk a bit about um, the relationship of your? your uh, ultra-chromatic music to the spiritual intention of your compositions? Uh, is there a relationship there? There is a relation. There is a relation, of course, but it's very difficult to formulate it. I feel it deeply. Mm, I feel the, uh, the drive, this drive towards uh, uh, microtonals from a uh, deep feeling that the world of sounds, the, uh, the uh, space, the musical space, is infinite. The uh, quantity of the sounds are infinite, and the musical space is really a fullness. And not only like uh, our music, it's uh, not fullness, but uh, sort of void, full, with uh, steps discontinued, uh, um, which are put like uh, points on a line, um, on, a, on a continuous line. Um, <clears throat> therefore, I can say uh, that uh, this drive towards microtonal, um, uh, microtones was really a drive towards continuum or even an intuition of continuum. And even uh, I sort of heard it. I felt with, my, with all my being and with my ear, with my e interior ear, I heard it. I heard all this fullness. I, uh, uh, and uh, not uh, continuum as a static, uh, immovable chord, but as something living. And uh, from that uh, came my all my uh, ultrachromatic um, uh, music. Now you did a composition for the Onde Martineau. Uh, in that, did you achieve a continuous to uh, glissando? Yes, of course. The, there I uh, achieved continuous glissando, and uh, it was very for me uh, very precious. But. I consider that uh, continuum in time, it's not the, uh, how to say, um, it's something, uh, what is wonderful in the continuum, as you can see, this is unattainable. But in time, it is attainable, and it's attainable in something, if it uh, it's can be used even in a vulgar way, uh, for instance, in a woo, you see, some, uh, you know, when this drive of the country, it's not something, it's something very, very subtle, subtle. One can't take it so uh, literally. You know, that is uh, continued. There is going, of course, I use it, I use it, but only, I use this glissando, but only when I feel it is in the work, it is convenient, it's good. In this work for Martineau, it was, I just conceived it from the very beginning, a piano, a pianis, a playing pianissimo chords, uh, sort of balancing chords, and on this phone, the, the Marti, Martino makes uh, sort of a melody by glissandos. Who was the biggest influence on your music as a young composer? Um, I had a great influence, of course, of, of von Scriabin, von Scriabin, who was, uh, for me, uh, my master, and musically speaking, and spiritually speaking, and I wouldn't say master even, but uh, he was uh, inspired. And, um, I may say that uh, also spiritually, I had some experience, uh, but which is very difficult to speak. 
uh, which uh, really put me on my feet and uh, made uh, for me uh, they made um, as a result that I am though I am inspired by Scribe as well I am his pupil in a sense uh, that I am not his uh, uh, epigone I feel as I'm not even that I feel my own uh, music which is uh, very often doesn't resemble at all on Scriabin. Mm, but um, could you talk about the time that you met Scriabin? That must have been very special. Uh, Scriabin, I met him once only, but really that was not important for me. For me, what is important it was his music and his ideas, his uh, uh, spiritual message, uh, uh, all what he was as a person. That's what I knew, first of all, for his music. And then from the books which read, it was written uh, about him by Sabanev, by other uh, critics. And my meeting with him was in a society uh, with many people. Mm, I was at that time a very young man, and uh, I was shy, and especially Scraven was for me like a god. I felt. Um, Intimidate, how to say in English. Intimidated. I, intimidated. I feel That's it. <laughs> intimidated, yes. Mm, uh, by uh, to meeting him, I didn't dare even to ask him to, to speak to him. But you were at dinner at a young friend's house, and it's interesting to me because this man was also a composer. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, the, uh, I had a, um, a good friend, um, a composer of my age, uh, which is named Igor Mikhlashevsky. I speak about him because I felt that music, uh, losing him, uh, lost a great composer and a composer who could uh, continue uh, Scriabin's tradition because it was something in common with his composition with Scriabin. But uh, these men uh, dared uh, to go to Moscow uh, I will, I will, we was living in, uh, it was time, at this time it was Petrograd, in, 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 not Petersburg, but Petrograd, uh, to show him his composition, uh, his uh, early composition. And when Scriabin came uh, to Petrograd to give his uh, uh, two concerts, uh, piano recitals with his work, it was in January 1915, uh, three years before his death, um, before his death. Three months, was it? Oh, oh yes. It's three months. Me. Yeah, yes. Three months, three months uh, of his death. He died, he died uh, 15th of March, 1915. Uh, then uh, when he came in January, then my friend invited him uh, to a dinner. And they invited me at the same time, and there were many other people also. And uh, I just uh, listened to who was, who was talking, and that I remember for forever. And especially how he he talked, he had a special way of talking. It was something so wonderful and something like music. When I heard him speaking, it is a little bit. Uh, I remembered his prelude, his. Uh, Poems and you know, all his works. Did he speak quietly? He sp he spoke quietly. Yes, he spoke quietly, but he had some intonation of his voice, uh, which uh, was scribinistic. <laughs> I can't say uh, anything else. Yes. And what became of your friend, the young composer? Uh, when I left uh, Russia, really, I left with the intention to build quartetone piano. Uh, that was for me a necessity. I hope at first that the Soviet uh, uh, government would do something uh, for me, because at that moment um, uh, all the researches in the art were uh, encouraged by the government. And the futurists and the cubists and all the avant-garde uh, in music and uh, in the in painting, in poetry at the time, Mayakovsky also, uh, they were, say, they are working hand in hand with the revolution. 
Uh, but, uh, of course, it was possible. At that time, uh, everything was possible in Russia. It was possible to build uh, a quarter of tone piano in spite of hunger, in spite of everything was dislocated. Uh, but I had no chance. Therefore, um, I had the intention to go abroad and to, be, uh, to build uh, a quarter tone, uh, uh, quarter tone instruments, particularly piano. And uh, really, my intention, I thought, uh, after it, it come back to Russia, uh, uh, it was difficult to get past. So I went uh, illegally and said, if I come back with my avions, everything will be forgiven to me. And then I had very uh, difficulties for building with it. You know, from Russia, uh, we were naive. <laughs> we thought, Occident is everything. Occident is possible to do everything. I think I will come to Paris to say, I invented the um, quartet on piano, build with everybody will be, you, of course, we will, we, will do, we will do, we can do everything, if not France, Germany. <laughs> and uh, the reality, was, bitter reality was different. It was very difficult to interest anybody in France. For two years I passed in France, and then um, firma Pleyel was interested a little, a little bit. And they tried to do something, and then it was not success. Then I went to Germany and met Alois Haber. And then we worked for nine months, and then I got back, and then Haber remained. And only in 29, uh, it means uh, 10 years after I um, uh, get this, uh, uh, this, uh, as you say, ultra-chromatic revelation, uh, I got a quarter tone piano. And even I would say that uh, I got the piano, and uh, at that moment I got more ripe uh, spiritually and musically, and uh, I saw practically so that it is not at all a practical solution. And then finally I came definitively in the 36 to the final solution to play, make play, realize um, quarter tone music. And, uh, or six tone music on instruments, I must take two ordinary pianos and tune one of them quarter tone apart. If a six tone, I take three pianos and tune them at the difference of a six tone. And since then, I'm faithful to this principle. And all this, uh, my, my all repertoire, all, all my compositions, I practically all written for two or four pianos or for three pianos in a six tone. Could you speak a bit about your composition, uh, Also Sprague Zarathustra? Uh, about Sprague Zarathustra, you know, I had this, uh, this uh, first um, uh, inspiration still in Russia in uh, uh, 1918 or 19. It's that moment that I, that um, this idea, this, uh, um, this, um, the, uh, how to say impetus it. Is it? The, 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 the towards continuum came to my mature, maturity and then I began I, then I tuned it I had two pianos in my house I tuned them quarters on apart and began experimenting and, uh, and uh, uh, repeat me the question Encipale uh, Zarathustra. Oh yes, uh, at that time, uh, just, um, uh, the idea, the chief idea, uh, the themes of the four parts of the, the symphony, it is a symphony, um, written not on the Zarathustra as we know it, but on the first sketch of the um, first plan that Nietzsche made, and he intended to write uh, a book in s four parts, which would correspond to a four movements of a symphony. So he conceived a book like a symphony, and then I conceived his book, his sketch, as a symphony. You see, it was a re reverse. And he gave um, a verbal, um, uh, verbal definition of each part, and those uh, verbal definitions gave me this uh, shock uh, which uh, awakened me all these themes uh, but at that moment, I really, the uh, instrumental um, uh, problem was not solved to me. 
I didn't know for what instrument to write. Uh, I was not ripe enough to consider two pianos as, uh, as an instrument, as a, later I did. Uh, therefore, I left it uh, quiet, and then much later, already when I had the piano, and 1930, I wrote the whole symphony Zarathustra for uh, piano, quarter on piano, six hand, a quarter on harmonium, four, I had quarter on harmonium, then strings and for example, clarinet. And in this form, it was quite um, absolutely unplayable. <laughs> and I could, not, I could not find anybody to play with one pianist, and of course it's one piano, not three pianists. Uh, and uh, I was in, and really in an impasse, as uh, in French, the French say. And it, at that at moment, this moment, I came this um, decision, which was for me really the, the, right, uh, the right one, to play not for the new instruments, but for the instruments which exist already, for two pianos. And I reworked all the uh, uh, composition written be uh, before for piano, for string, re re reworked for two or four pianos. And with this, uh, I had uh, built a repertoire and could give a whole concert with four pianos. Came differently. In 37, it was really, uh, this moment was for me uh, very important in my way of conquering uh, the esteem of the world. Because, uh, yes. The, well, the, the, the thing I was going to say was the um, uh, Zarathustra piece to me, which is one of the few I've heard of yours, yes. uh, seems to me to be one of the most successful, but it's in a different style from your later pieces. It seems more neoclassic in a way because the rhythms are so regular. And in your later pieces, you have much more complex rhythms. Uh, really, uh, the, um, re um, uh, the rhythms are also uh, rather complex, uh, especially in the slow movement. Mm, uh, but uh, the whole, as the French say, the march was intermediary between classic and what became a future. My way was progressive. Uh, I conceive it uh, ultrachromatic revolution as something very deep and serious. And not like it's an avant-garde movement in the contemporary music. That was superficial for me. I th thought that uh, I must begin very simple, so that simple people understand and like quarter tone music. It's not only for the elite, uh, and uh, I tried also to write music, and try it, but it, it came from itself, music which is attractive and which I like myself. I didn't write a note which I don't like. So, and um, uh, therefore, uh, I feel people who li uh, listen to my music, maybe they criticize, they say that it is a little bit too classic, not enough revolution in it, but let them speak, I, I don't care. What is important for me is they, li they like it. They didn't say, oh yes, now we see that quarter tone is not only something farfelu, something uh, crazy, that is something serious and deep, that one can write very deep, uh, very beautiful music with it, and even harmonies, uh, harmonies, are more beautiful, more refined, more sound, uh, deeper than the um, simple. Uh, and one um, critic, even after listening to this, uh, uh, um, just this Ansipar uh, Zarathustra, um, it was uh, in Belgium, it was played in 1945, just after the war. He said, that's uh, he said, so the, uh, the impression is hallucinating, so wonderful, uh, so pronounced, so taking, that after that, an ordinary half-tone uh, score seems banal. You see, that was for me what I want. And then avant-gardists can say everything what they want about that is uh, a little bit too classic. I mean, this, uh, imp that's what is important for me. And that way, I will conquer. But if I will be avant-gardist, I will not conquer. I will be just one of the avant-gardists. You see? 
I, I am I'm a side. I am a revolutionist, not avant-gardist. Revolution, a revolutionist is like an army. It has its avant-garde, it has the avant-garde, it has uh, flank, the flank, the, uh, and uh, I have everything in me. I have the, I am the whole army. I am not the only avant-garde. You see, that's my conception. As I understand it, you wish to have your pieces eventually performed in a special space designed just for the pieces. Is that right? Uh, no, 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 it's not, it's not just quite that. Yes, I talk uh, about uh, building a, sp a special, a special building uh, uh, that I call it even temple, um, a bit, uh, um, a bit projections of uh, uh, designs, color designs. No, uh, what my music is uh, written up till now, it's concert music to, to, to be played in a concert hall. That is, uh, that uh, my uh, this vision, if you want, or pro uh, the same vision and project, uh, or dream, even if you want, it is uh, uh, connected deeply with a work written for uh, just uh, a score written for color, for color designs, and for uh, music and written for special instrument uh, in a microtonal system of 12 tones. The, the uh, finest mi microtonal system that can, can exist, you see, and which is impossible now with our condition. But that, uh, you know, it's too big conception to even to speak uh, a few words. It involves a revolution, also a spiritual revolution of uh, mankind and also it's something that, that, that should provoke it's something if you want that will continue the day of existence because the day of existence is my most important work it's never uh, jamais dépassé it's never dépassed uh, but i would like in the end of my life to write something which is uh, uh, how to say dépassé uh, Timeless, is it? No, no. In the passé, it means something which is stronger than, which goes further uh, than, uh, than the present. Uh, because uh, up till now, it, there is a sort of dualism. On one hand, I have the day of existence. It's like one composer, right? and then the whole microtonal music is another composer. You recently uh, had a performance directed by Gunther Schuller. Could you talk a bit about the uh, correspondence you had with him? Um, yeah, well, it was uh, quite uh, unexpected. Uh, I heard it uh, from the... Uh, um, I must say that um, I see Zavatustra is edited by an edition which is called um, uh, Edition de l'Oiseau Lire. Uh, and uh, they made before the war even a record of the slow parts of it. Uh, since then, time passed, uh, and uh, it was performed uh, twice uh, during the third year. And I said it is not interesting, maybe for, for the editor, and I asked it to give me the rights. Uh, and Madame Hansen, which was the the, the, uh, the chief of the editor, uh, well, uh, then we, we had uh, she was very ready. And I said, you know, it's very funny. Uh, just, uh, um, just recently, a few days ago, I received a letter from Boston. They asked me for the Zaratustra Symphony. They won't play it. How is possible? I said, it's true. Ah, I, I must. Uh, and what, what did you do? I, did, uh, I, I sent them four scores. I said, my goodness, why did you do that? You must um, put uh, send them. Piano parts, separate because on this course, the pianist cannot uh, play this course. Uh, pianos, there are quarter tone signs, they cannot play it. Ah, I, I, I didn't know. Uh, we, we lost, we lost this, this, this. Oh, if we would know it, I would send, the, but I have um, uh, the piano parts. Tell me, please, the address and I'll send my piano, maybe it's the time. Yes, it is time, it is only man, man, man's time, it was only man's time. I, I came at the moment, and she gave me the others, and I sent them, and at the same time, I wrote a word to Gunther Schuller, and she, she gave me 
told me that Gunther Schuller will reform. And uh, then it was so quiet, 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 a concert, right? Uh, and, uh, oh yes, I telephoned, uh, telephoned to Boston, even to the New England uh, Conservatory, uh, where uh, Günther Schuller is the uh, director. And uh, the chief librarian, with whom I spoke, he said, yes, yes, we are going to play that, and we'll send you a tape, even. Wonderful. After um, the rate, uh, very time passed over, uh, yes, and then I wrote also to Günther Schuller uh, some uh, um, indication as I was saying, that there is no, there is some difference between the score and the parts. Indicate what is the right one. By the way. And much later, I received a, a wonderful letter from Günther Schuller. Uh, he said, first of all, excuses that he played not the whole symphony, but only the slow part, but it was impossible because one of the, uh, they had no time and one of the pianists got a sick, something like that. Well, it was impossible, but he said he had the whole intention to play the symphony, in the entire symphony. And uh, uh, with the pianos or with the instruments? Uh, the with, with four pianos. With four pianos. With four yeah. pianos. Yeah. No, because my old version for uh, um, uh, for uh, this for quarter tone pianos, it's a fantastic version. It was destroyed. Not even destroyed. I uh, forgot to tell you that the first and second part, uh, uh, second and uh, third parts, were entirely recomposed, because the first version I found. It was the um, first version finished at 30, and 36, six years later, I made this arrangement. But at that time, my thought became more mature, and I saw that the second and third words, they are not worthwhile any, just nothing. I just tore them away and rewrote them again anew, for, for, directly for four pianos. Mm. Uh, well, uh, so he, uh, in, uh, for four pianists, um, he, he played, uh, and uh, he, in his in his letters, he said me very nicely he, that he would like uh, to play in his original version uh, with quarter tone piano and quarter tone harmonium. But at that time, uh, that uh, I answered to him, dear Mr. Schuller, I'm very, uh, very moved that you won't do that. But it doesn't exist anymore, and it was very unsuccessful, very it's destroyed. But that I have, if I have time, I have the whole intention to write for orchestra, no, not for simple orchestra, but choosing the instruments, because now I know instruments, you know how to, uh, for instance, all the brasses, they can play uh, quarter tones. The um, wood instruments, they cannot. Very difficult. I will not use them. I will use old Martino, maybe, uh, then strings, and have two pianos in the orchestra, two piano students at the quarter tone, who would be the support for the orchestra. It's that way that I wrote several uh, scores uh, after that. With oblig uh, obligado, uh, oblig uh, like, uh, uh, you know, like in seventh century, they had uh, the uh, they wrote, for instance, with for the strings, and it was clavsa uh, as uh, the uh, was written obligado. Nun, uh, and uh, so that uh, that was my my uh, my relation. What other performances do you have coming up? I had a performance in the United States. Uh, uh, by uh, John Dirks and his wife, Thelma Dirks, who's a both pianist. Uh, they are uh, uh, professors of music uh, in uh, Hollins College. And they played there uh, some of my 24 preludes, uh, which will be um, published soon by the uh, publisher Bilayev uh, in Germany. And they played uh, nine of these 24 preludes. And this year, they repeated this concert, but in a more important town in Richmond, which is much bigger than uh, Holmes College. 
And, uh, and now there's a chance that uh, perhaps there will be a performance of the Day of Existence at the French radio, you say? Oh, yes, yes. That will be for me uh, be a very big moment of my life because though, uh, though it is my most important work, I st up till now, I, it was never played. I never wanted to play it. There are many motives for that. Uh, motives, you know, humility. I, you know, humility and pride. It's really two sides of the of the same of the same. Uh, one's one side, they are, oh, I'm humble. I'm. I, I don't think it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't say pride. You, you will not worthy of this, of this, this work. Why should I play with it? It's too, too, too fine, too, too profound. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But it's been over 50 years in the making. <laughs> yes. If, if, uh, no, well, I was very, uh, let's say frankly, I was very occupied with my, with my quarter tone activity. It was plenty enough for, for two uh, humans' life, really. And now I am now a young man, you see, uh, and my life is a more, uh, it doesn't remain for me so much to live. And uh, it was moment, uh, it was a few months ago, I think it's in the autumn, in the autumn the last year, I thought to myself, that really, I think maybe it's good to play it still. It was also such a con uh, consideration. It is written in musical language. It's not at all revolutionary. And really now, it is such a success with all this avant-garde. Uh, they will not even, uh, add, uh, in the, even uh, uh, con consider that they were interested uh, to play. So uh, this was not humility, not, not a pri not a pride, but simply a sort of uh, realistic calculation. Uh, but still, this desire becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And finally, uh, like his interior voice said to me, you must do that. You must do it in spite of what we'll say. Day of existence must be played. And then uh, it happens something very uh, wonderful uh, uh, that uh, all, uh, about the this, uh, this same time, um, I had a, a proposition from radio, from a young man who wanted to make an uh, interview with me. And he said to me, uh, you know, I admire you very much, and I think it's very uh, unjust uh, and people treat you uh, in France, especially. I'm not performing in France as if I didn't exist. I'm performing in the United States. I am performed in Canada, in Germany. I am not yet performed, but one speaks very much about me. My my name is known. I receive letters from Germany. Uh, so he said to me, uh, "You know, I will uh, want to make an uh, uh, interview with you, and it will be in radio performance as uh, entretien avec le compositeur." Compositor uh, Ivan Vushnigratsky. And he came to me tw uh, five times. And, and what happened? He came five times. Uh, every interview was three hours. Wow. And I spoke. First interview, I spoke. Uh, the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole time I, sp I spoke. No, excuse me. Oh yes, yes, three, three, three hours. Uh, I spoke an hour and a half without stopping. <laughs> you see, and I thought uh, I spoke ten minutes. I said no, oh, or five. No, I think now it must be a session. Oh no, you spoke an hour and a half. No, and shortly uh, there is, of course, af uh, after. The, he had an enormous quantity. He had to choose and to make montage and to introduce some of my uh, music, uh, which uh, uh, the French radio has in its. Uh, the, the, I was the eight or nine times played in the French radio, and they have uh, in their uh, archive. archive 
they have the, the, uh, the tapes. And uh, during this interview, of course, first thing, I spoke about my day of existence and spoke what I just to told you, how uh, finally I decided that I must, I must, uh, I don't want even to have a quarter tone concept. Please, please play the day of existence and then we'll see, we'll play. And then was a little discussion and finally, uh, now, uh, uh, you, oh yes, I had one single score on the single. Um, and my first um, uh, first thing what I decided to do is to uh, make a new score. But the uh, size of the score is so enormous that there is no machine that can uh, do it. Um, so I went there, 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 uh, it, it found finally a photographer who consented to um, print every page twice, the upper side and the, and then make the montage. And it took several months. And so I had to, uh, um, in was in possession of two uh, copies. And at that moment, just uh, uh, um, I met this young man and he took uh, all the, uh, he, he took my did this interview. Uh, and What's his name? The his name, he's very young, he's not known. His name is Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. Uh, I think his name will be known. Uh, he's very courageous and very energetic. And um, then, uh, when this score, second, I gave him the original score. And now he printed there, but in small. They have uh, machines which can. Uh, diminish the size, and he's, um, uh, he printed several copies of uh, this score of the Day of the Existence and gave it to the director, to the musical director, who acquaintance, and he was on my side. He said, "Yes, we. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, it's worthwhile to play." So I see, to my great uh, surprise, that in spite of it's written in a uh, in a not avant-garde way, it's perfectly acceptable. And I think that I noticed that, uh, myself that probably my name became more, uh, you know, I have more authority than I think myself. And uh, it seems very interesting to know uh, how, um, uh, anyhow, maybe, how is the essence, but how this quarter tone composer, what was his first uh, work? What was the work, uh, how sounds the work from which comes all the future uh, development? Mm, uh, now it will uh, must pass uh, through the comité de lecture, what's called the comité de lecture. Then there will, uh, will be maybe some, but I think since I have this uh, support of the director, I think the, uh, uh, and then even with Pfeiffer, we talk as if it is already okay. And then I'm preparing uh, the, this uh, arrangement for uh, the speaker with the piano, and then all the preparative work is going on. And I will make the future, um, future uh, conductor, which is uh, favorite thing. Could you show me some of this piano, which is the quarter tone piano? Uh, how you organize your music. You, you do it in, uh, not the octave. You have something besides the octave. Oh, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. It's, I, um, uh, it's not that I, all, mu all my music I um, organize that way. Uh, as I told, I had, uh, I proceeded step by step. I began very simple. Then came a certain period of intermediary between uh, uh, between uh, classical and uh, revolutionary is the uh, Zarathustra. And um, l much later, after the war, in the uh, 50th year, I came to formulate a certain um, theory, a certain conception, I call it the non-Octavian spaces. Why do you call it that? Uh, I call it uh, because the foundation of this, uh, let us say, this conception, this doctrine, 
is uh, that a sound is uh, transposed not to an octave, but to a seventh or to the ninth. It means I consider the seventh and the ninth as a shortened octave, uh, as the comprise or, or the dilate, how, how do you call it? Uh, uh, expanded. Ex expanded octave. So there's the octave. And then, I, uh, in my theory, how I read it, it can be, in principle, it can be uh, shortened or expanded by all the degrees, ultramarotic degrees, that I conceived with. 12 tone, then 6 tone, quarter tone, uh, uh, third tone, five, five tone, until the uh, half tone. Uh, to the, uh, then it can be, of course, uh, shortened more, but in my exposition, as I expose it in the special number of Review Musical, uh, it is a, a sketch of, the, of this conception, Mm, uh, I, um, I limit myself to the half tone, uh, half tone seventh and the half tone um, ninth. So um, uh, that is uh, um, that is the short octave, and that is the uh, expanded octave. It can be a uh, uh, quarter tone. I uh, shorted it by quarter tone, and uh, I delay, uh, uh, de 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 delay, uh, de uh, expand. Expanded by, uh, by quarter tone. And uh, this um, procedure, this is procedure uh, theoretically, I apply to the whole musical space, from the lowest uh, uh, tone till the very, so for instance, I take the lowest, uh, um, sound, the E, and then seventh, seventh. And that's the basis of my harmonic, of the harmonic uh, uh, doctrine, of the harmonic conception of the, and then the learn. So instead of having the uh, harmonic space divided into octaves, you divide it into irregular groupings, or rather regular groupings. Regular groupings, but, but by, uh, by a ninth, uh, by, uh, by small octaves or by big octaves. That's fascinating. That's a, that's yes. a very original sort of theory. Yes, yes, and it uh, comes very natural from all my um, previous music, which I called uh, empiric. I composed empirically, by, but I try to express myself more and more acute, more and more uh, strong, uh, and uh, instinctively I use it chords where uh, these uh, these intervals of seventh and ninth were employed. By the way, like Schoenberg did, it. really I systematize it. What really was in in air. It was never systematized by anybody because the young uh, musicians after the, uh, the war, they all went to the Seriel uh, composition. Seriel really d doesn't interest me as uh, being microtonalist. How can it interest me? Because I don't know how many uh, uh, sound I have. Today I have 24, tomorrow I have, will, have, will have 36. I cannot make a series with the 36 tones. <laughs> and then if I have 12 tones, I have 72. Oh, so it's, uh, but uh, the, um, the cyc I call it cyclic conception. The cyclic conception, it's fit very well to the ultrachromatic, uh, ultrachromatic world. Could you show me how you play a, uh, a scale on this keyboard? You have three keyboards here. Yes. And you can go from, uh, and the lowest and the highest keyboard are the same exactly, and the middle one is a quarter tone away. Yes. So in order, in order for you to play a scale with your right hand and take all of the quarter tones, how would you do it? Uh, I, I didn't quite understand. Uh, when you play a scale, how do you do it? Yes, a quarter tone scale. Yes, yes, exactly. I play uh, um, alternatively. Uh, C 
on the first keyboard and C on the second, C sharp on the first keyboard and C sharp on the second, because the C on the second keyboard is just in between C and C sharp. You see, C, C sharp, and then C, C, and then C on the on the second keyboard. It's a quarter tone, and then C sharp. See. Now, in that case, why do you need to have the third keyboard? Ah, the third keyboard I need for the pian for pianistic uh, reasons because um, uh, practice, uh, practice, musical practice showed me that some of my composition, for instance, uh, was really unplayable with two keyboards only. Uh, there were cases when uh, Han plays an octave on the second keyboard, which is in the middle. Uh, fingers must play on the first. So I cannot, uh, you know, position, I can't reach. They can't reach. Your fingers don't go down they backwards. Go down so down. they must go up. They go up. And uh, in order to give them the possibility to uh, to reach the sound, I saw that it's necessary to put all the same. Uh, sounds that are in the second keyboard to put on the second and the third uh, additional keyboard. Did you ever write a piece for two people sitting at the quarter tone piano? Uh, well, I, uh, <laughs> my Zaratustra was written even for three persons uh, written uh, uh, sitting on, uh, on a quarter tone um, piano. Uh, but um, no, 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 I, I never, I never did it. Never did it. Well, this is a, a fascinating keyboard because uh, there are so few of these in the world. How many do you think are in existence? Uh, I know in Prague, where Alois Haba was a professor uh, of the conservatory, and uh, who, between the two walls, he taught, taught um, uh, harmony and uh, also quarter tone, quarter tone harmony. So there is uh, uh, a, a grand piano, a grand, a grand quarter-tone piano. And outside of this grand quarter-tone piano, Haba ordered uh, to the uh, firm, uh, after I, uh, he heard that I ordered an opera piano, he heard it for himself also an opera piano in his private uh, apartment. Uh, it's really destined not to be played at concerts, uh, but uh, uh, to be an instrument of work, uh, because really one cannot make research, research, electrochromatic research, without having a keyboard instrument. Schumann said that when I was a composer without piano. It was very good in Schumann's time, when music was major, minor, dominante, sudominante, everything was uh, in the head. That was possible to, uh, without piano. But when one begins to research new sonorities, new chords, then one must uh, verify. One must verify, yes. And this instrument has uh, uh, one harp, in back of the other harp, is that right? Yes, yes. Both yes. of them standing upright, like an upright piano. Uh, like an upright piano, it's really two pianos in one. Uh, and uh, the under keyboard is uh, communicating with the first uh, uh, piano uh, set of uh, strings, and the second uh, keyboard uh, communicates with the uh, true special uh, transmission uh, to the second uh, Well, isn't it possible then that you could have uh, timbral interplay between the two harps? In other words, if you're, uh, isn't there some resonance that goes from one harp to the other if the pedal is down? Uh, you see, there is a funny resonance. For instance, I have um, uh, the pedal, uh, my right pedal is divided, and the left also, they are divided in two parts. One acts on one keyboard or on the other. If I put, uh, how is it? Yes, I put uh, a key, uh, let us say my uh, foot on the keyboard of the second, 
of uh, uh, of the second keyboard and play a chord on the first, means the short boom, and then I see uh, listen a resonance on, on the second. Let, let just, me hear that. Yes, mm, uh, uh, I hear right. It is the second. You see, uh, uh, and then let us say I play. You see, it's the second keyboard uh, uh, sounds. The, the, the first, you see, the first is short. Did you ever use this as an effect in the no, piece? No, because I... I it's uh, particularly uh, the effect of this piano. Since this piano I don't use uh, in concert, I can't use. Uh, I think uh, the fact um, is that the both uh, sets of strings, they are very near to each other. And therefore, uh, there is some vibration. Sympathetic vibration. Uh, when two pianos are the, are the difference, uh, are the distance, I don't think that it would, uh, it would act. I never tried to do Well, it was very interesting having sympathetic vibrations with you tonight. Oh, yes. And I always enjoy <laughs> visiting with you, Ivan. Thank so you. We, we, are not, uh, we are in tuned at quarter tone, I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like that we are tuned at unison, <laughs> at simple unison. Thank you very much for visiting. And uh, uh, Ivan, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for participating in our broadcast. And I thank you very much also and greet all the listeners.